Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Friends Occasionally Not Disagreeing. It's us. Hi. We're the problem. It's us. I am Joe, and joining me, as always, is Cody. We're going to have to pause this episode. Put you in the Ticketmaster queue. Just wait. We'll be right back with you. Uh, Ah! But I shouldn't have to wait too long in the queue because I have a presale code and a boost on my account. Oh, no. That doesn't matter. Anyway, (laughs) might be a little tease as to what this week's topic is. Speaking of tease. Um, Oh, before we get into that, though, uh, (laughs) as we have been doing for the, the past while, thought we'd start by talking a little bit about what we've been up to lately. Um, I just really have like one thing I wanted to mention, so I'll get that out of the way. Sounds like Cody might have a few things to talk about. So many things. Oh boy. Um, one thing I wanted to give a shout out to, uh, my wife and I recently watched the first season of the Apple TV plus series severance. Ooh, Dave Mansell will be happy. And it is a very good season of television. Um, I feel like it's one of the rare seasons that kind of, it's just consistently great start to finish the season finale. Like I won't say what happens, but it's like a very satisfying season finale. So it's just a, a, a great series. I will, for the listener out there, I I will describe the basic premise of the show. This is something that's established very quickly in the first episode. So not spoilery, but. The main idea behind the show is that the main character, and it kind of becomes an ensemble, but works for a company that has designed this procedure wherein they're basically able to create a separate version of a person that only exists in certain situations. So most of the show is centered around the main character played by Adam Scott works in this office and basically... He goes into work every morning while he's on the elevator to his office. The version of him that went into work that morning ceases to exist. And for eight hours, it's a completely separate version of himself that only exists in the office. When he leaves at the end of the day, the outside version of, they call them Audis and Innies. um, The outside version of himself takes over again and he has no idea what he's been doing for the past eight hours of work. So it's kind of the ultimate way to, you know, have people work with potentially sensitive information. Oh, you know, okay. they, they, they they literally have no idea what they do at their work. They like, and they even go as far as they have the employees stagger the times that they start so that none of them knows anyone else who works in that office. Oh, well, so they, they, okay. there's no risk of them like recognizing each other outside. That part I did. I didn't know any of that part. Okay. Yeah, but I mean, that's the basic premise, you know, obviously questions are raised and explored over the course of the season, but it's just a a fascinating and like surprisingly hilarious at times show. So I very highly recommend (laughs) a job. You only work eight hours a day. That does sound funny. (laughs) Uh, I have one of those. It's not great, but what have you been up to, Cody? I was going to make a joke about your job. That's probably too inside for public airing here but anyway um i may have mentioned in one of the last couple podcasts have spent most of my time recently buying shit and a lot of shit so black friday i bought a lot of crap you, you, Cyber you Monday, know you I can a lot of crap. make your own shit for free you just i know but it's always better to have somebody else's shit there you gotta make other people shit your shit that's how you get the shit that's good shit I'll be swearing a lot on today's podcast, P.S., more than I normally do. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. Um, One of the things, of the many things I've been buying, is I got back into AEW Trading Cards, which is a wrestling company. Oh, no. Someday I will do some sort of a little mini episode on here at some point. Um, But they have two different types of boxes, long story short here. They have one box that is very expensive, that is sold in like specialty baseball card, comic bookstore type places and then they have like the general one they would put probably like a walmart or target or whatever so i bought a box a single box of the first kind that came out and the kids and i spent uh, several nights opening that a couple packs at a time which was really fun because the kids love to do this with me so it's kind of become really fun 
this is the second year they've kind of done cards and we had a couple cool cards we've got an autograph and some other cool ones in the first uh first ones we got there and then i just got <laughs> all of the ones that i had ordered myself as a birthday present uh in the mail today so there is a let's just call it a pyramid for a lack of a better word of boxes of wrestling cards my in god my dining room right now and so uh before don't we... get too excited ladies he's married <laughs> Before we came on the air today, uh, we opened up the first box and we each took two packs to open. And it's just fun to like be into trading cards again, which I really hadn't done since I was probably like 12 or 13, you would say. Um, but it's fun because like we opened up the six packs tonight, two each, and I got one that was uh, kind of like a semi rareish one that's stamped uh, 399 of them are out there. And we got one of them tonight, uh, which is cool. And my son. And the very first pack he opened of all of these boxes of cards that I bought, pulled out a uh, relic card, which is from the wrestler Brian Danielson, or you may know him as Daniel Bryan from the WWE when he was there. I but don't know him as either of those names. That's fair. It's this cool um, subset, though, where it actually is like a super thick card and actually contains like a piece of his shirt within the card. So it's like a clothing that is cool. It's, it's a clothing piece, and there's only and his was stamped to fifty, so there's only fifty of them in the world, and he got one of them on the very first pack we opened tonight. So that's cool. It's just fun to open them up, and we get a ton of like doubles and triples of the common ones, but it's just fun to like what could be in there. You know, it's kind of like gambling in a way, I suppose, but you kind of get a high. You can outfit. clone a wrestler now. It's, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. But it's pretty fun. There's a big community on these online and stuff, so we've been having a lot of fun with that, and. uh other than that, I've just been in panic mode as far as I realized like a week ago, I hadn't really got on buying Christmas stuff yet. And that's always a panic to me because I you're too busy about... buying cards for yourself. I mean... It's true. I really was. I'm not going to lie. I really was. But I always panic about like, is it good to get here in time? And like, you know, if it says it's good to get here on the 18th, is it really good to get here on the 18th or is it good to get here on the 26th? You know, um, and with the little ones, that's you want to make sure you got all your stuff lined up and ready to go for Christmas morning. And uh, so that's kind of what I've been doing is just really hitting that the last week. I think I did almost everything in one week. So that's been where I've been spending a lot of my time. Nice. Yeah. That's all very exciting. It was all very exciting. That uh, that, that everything you've been up to lately? Uh, pretty much. We finished The Masked Singer, which was... Pretty good ending to that. I think we're in fair game for spoilers at this point. The winner was Amber Riley, I think is her name for this season. And second place was a surprise out of nowhere reunited. Wilson Phillips took second place this, really? this season. So that was kind of a surprise. Uh, in third we're, place, possibly. Were, were, were all three of them sharing a mask? Uh, they were. They all had a different costume. They were the lambs. There were three lambs, though, but we didn't know who they were until really the last episode. Um, and then third place was actually the comedian. Is it Nikki Glazier? Is that how she says her name from the roast? Is Glazer? Glazer, yeah, Glazer. Um, from the Comedy Central roast, she actually took third place for the season. She had a pretty decent singing voice for not a talent you would know her for. So that's cool. Yeah, I've been kind of curious about that show, but not enough to actually watch it. <laughs> it's fun. It's like it just something that should not exist in America on TV. Yeah. In Japan, have you sure. uh, have you seen? I think it's from the UK one where they had the lead singer from Aha on it. No, oh, it's amazing. You can find if you just go on YouTube. There's like a super cut where it's like all his performances. I mean, he does have one of the best voices he ever. He has an amazing singing voice. Nobody recognized him. They even had him sing "Take on Me" on one of the episodes. Still, nobody nobody knew who he was. <laughs> <laughs> that's the one trick they haven't pulled on the american one yet that i've seen is i've never had somebody sing their own song yeah i keep waiting for that day to happen but maybe it's a rule i don't know but anyway you should check that out um yeah, I definitely will well speaking of music and you know singing Take um, on me. Take on me. We're we're here today to talk about Aha, the greatest Norwegian band of all time, folks. That's right. If you thought one of the greatest singer songwriters of the 21st century, Aha, Aha, Aha yes, 
Ah, uh, what's the guy's? I want to say the guy's name is like Morgan Harkett or something like that. Could be. Anyway. If you're not a super fan and you've only seen the Take On Me video, which is fantastic, make sure you check out The Sun Also Shines on TV, the sequel video that actually finishes the story of those two characters. True. That's true. Oh, my God. It's so good, except sad. But uh, They did a James Bond theme song? I mean, this is this is an aha episode now. We got to do a Bond <laughs> theme episode. That's a, for sure. Anyway, um, well, let me, let me just, you know set the scene here a little bit i'm wearing okay. a i'm wearing a shirt with a bunch of different cats on it okay um i'm enjoying in this very nice you can't see it because my zoom background is clipping but this friends occasionally not disagreeing cup i'm enjoying now i'm generally a whiskey drinker okay man that looks like it keeps your beverages so cold i know it's it's ah oh, it just tastes so much better this is not a whiskey drink. This is, in fact, the favorite drink of a certain singer, according to a six-year-old interview, which would be a vodka and Diet Coke. I know. I know. I used to drink vodka Cokes, so I kind of get it. But... And what is, oh, I have this Christmas ornament next to me here that just came in the mail recently. Okay. It's a red typewriter. Okay. It's the, and... And the paper coming out of the typewriter says all too well. It says all too well. And then there's a ribbon on it that says Taylor's version. Oh. Because this week, ladies and gentlemen, and all genders in between, we are going to be talking about one Taylor Swift. What? And I have my mug here that says Morning Beautiful. Uh, It sure is. That doesn't have anything to do with Taylor Swift. Now, Cody Fleming. Yes. I like to think that I have fairly eclectic tastes when it comes to pretty much any media, movies, music, whatever. Um, some of my fa- favorite musical artists include... Aha. Uh-huh. Aha. Uh-huh. I love Metallica. I love Judas Priest. I love Black Sabbath. I love Neil Diamond. I love Willie Nelson. So I'm all over Lincoln the place. Park. Don't love Lincoln Park, but maybe but we'll get there. Going to... But one of my favorite artists, especially over the past few years, has become Taylor Swift. It shocks me as much as anyone else. Hmm. Um, so before we get into this, I guess I wanted to start by asking you. Yes. What is your personal history and relationship with the music of Taylor Swift? I am so glad you asked. Before and I then... get to that, <laughs> before I get to that, I want to preface the entire episode on my oh side with these couple things. Number one, I have in the past 15 years, 10 years at least, recognized throughout my years, I have a bad tendency to find music that other people enjoy that I don't enjoy and automatically shit on it without giving it a chance and mock people for the music that they enjoy. And I know this has not directly, but has, uh, you know, semi indirectly influenced relationships in my past. And I recognize this, that this is a terrible thing that I did and still do somewhat. So I recognize that I'm getting better at that. I'm going to put that out there first. Number two, I understand music diversity because I know I have a lot of music that I like that other people either don't get or totally hate. And I get that as well. So I get different strokes. And wait, let me, let me say this. Yes. It's fine to not like things. No, it's fine. It's it's totally okay. Everything is not for everyone. It's not a spoiler to say I didn't like this. I'm just prefacing the episode today with that. Sure. So there's that. Now, as far as my musical background with Taylor Swift, I don't have one. Uh, I haven't really listened to any of her albums all the way through that I know of, unless it was driving in a car, perhaps, with my wife, who is a big, uh, what are they called, Swiftaholics or Swifties uh, Anonymous or sw- Swaggers Swifties. or Swizzles or something? Swifties, much. Swifties. Yes, okay. Swifties. Jonathan Swifties, the ancient author. Uh, I yes. Love it. Um, so I don't know that I have a lot of history there. I basically only know her main signal singles that she's had out through the years. Who name some of those? Right now on the spot? Yes. Oh God. Um <laughs> we are never ever getting back together. Ah, that, see that you got one. It. That's one. Yeah. Um 
and other assorted songs by other Taylor such Swift. songs by yes. Taylor Swift. If I had longer, I could probably come up with more. I'm sure, but anyway, so you you, um, you don't really have much meaningful exposure no, to Taylor Swift. I let do me, not. Let me let me set the stage a little bit by telling you a little bit about Taylor Swift. You can go for it. What do you got? Taylor Swift is 32 years old. Oh my! Her 33rd birthday is actually the day after this episode will be dropping on December 13th. Happy birthday, Tay Tay! Taylor Swift. She released her first self titled album at the age of 16 and rocketed to superstardom thereafter. She has released 10 studio albums. Interestingly, Three of those have been released 2020 and after. So she's been busy. She's been busy, uh, all right. She's also released two re-recordings of two of her albums listed as Taylor's versions of those albums. And why is that, Joe? Well, she is a shrewd businesswoman. Softball down the middle, there you go. Why is that, Joe? She is a shrewd businesswoman. Explain, what do you mean? Um... Well, a while back, someone with a weird name bought the rights to her catalog prior to a certain point. I forget what the cutoff is. Um, My understanding, though, is that they own the rights to those actual recordings, but not the songs themselves. So in an effort to now emancipate herself. Yes. Well, so here's the thing. I love Taylor Swift. I think she's insanely talented. I do also think she is a shrewd businesswoman. And I don't think that the things that she does are always necessarily for the reason that she gives for them. Meaning she tried to position the re-recordings of these albums as she's taking it back. Like she's taking, it's her music. She's taking ownership because it's hers. But turns out the Taylor's versions of those albums also hit the charts again and sold like a bajillion copies. So, huh, coincidence. Hey, take that. from that what you will. I mean, but on the other hand, it's smart. Like, it's you can't like whatever her motivation was. It's smart of her to have done that. It literally paid off for her. So, yeah, I don't know the legality behind all that, but it would seem like has that been litigated? Because I can't imagine. Somebody's not going to be like, I paid all this money for this, and then you kind of tricked us out of having the rights to all these. Well, I mean, I, I I haven't looked that deeply into it, but I mean, like I said, from what I understand, he bought the recordings. Like, she, what I would assume happened is when she recorded these albums originally with, like, whatever label put them out, she retained the rights to the songs themselves. So they had okay. the rights to distribute those recordings. So the guy who bought the music would have only bought those existing recordings and not like the rights to the songs. So that allowed her to go in and and re-record it. Weird. Yeah. It's kind of, it is kind of a weird situation. Um, anyway, Taylor Swift has won 11 Grammy awards, three of which were for album of the year. And she is the only artist to have done that. I thought Beyonce won that one year. Uh, get out of here, Kanye. (laughs) I'm going to let you finish. (laughs) Um, She holds 84 Guinness World Records. Okay. Don't know what any of them are for, but... How many? I was just going to ask how many were for (laughs) X's. Okay, keep going. Uh, She has an estimate... Speaking of her business savviness, she has an estimated net worth of $570 million. Okay. Presumably that's going to grow a bunch over the next year as she goes on tour and sells a bunch of merch and who knows what else. With her most recent album, Midnight, she became the first artist in history to hold all top 10 spots in the Billboard Hot 100 list simultaneously. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. So she's, you know, however anyone might feel about her, she's been insanely successful. And I mean, she's 32 and she's been doing this for 16 years, literally half her life. It's it's just... You don't really see that kind of success too often. Um, I mean, the other thing, like, 
one of the things I find interesting about her is that she has reinvented herself several times throughout her career. You know, she True. started off very much as when she was 16, the whole image was she was like young country singer, yeah. you know, all sweet and innocent and whatever. And Christina Aguilera. No. Sort of. Yes. You know. Well, yeah, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Kind of like Disney Channel, you know. Yeah, that's true. Like early Christine Aguilera. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, over the course of her career, she's gone in an increasingly more pop direction um, to the point where her last couple albums prior to 2020, like she almost was dabbling in like rap, hip hop kind of vibes at times. Um, in 2020, she kind of took a hard left turn during the course of the pandemic. And that's really when I became a big fan of hers. I, I had enjoyed a lot of her singles, you know, pop songs before that, but one of my all time favorite bands, if not my all time favorite band of all time is the national. And in summer of 2020, it was somewhat shockingly announced that Taylor Swift was releasing a new album that was co-written and produced by Aaron Dessner, who is one of the guitarists for the National and one of their main songwriters. Okay. So that really grabbed my attention. Um, that album was Folklore, which came out July 24th, 2020. When it came out, I started hearing people singing its praises, and it basically was just super stripped down. Just a lot of acoustic guitars and pianos, really sparse arrangements, like really kind of a 180 turn from her last couple albums before that. Um, the songwriting felt a lot more kind of, there's a lot of storytelling and like dealing with like messy relationships. She said fuck a few times, which I don't know when she started doing that, but it seems like the older she's gotten, the more kind of risky she's been. Um, yeah, I know uh, this is just a smidge I know of her too, but hasn't hasn't she finally, after a very long time of people kind of pushing her to take a stance, hasn't she finally started getting a minorly political as well recently? Yes, um, in the past few years. Actually, there's a documentary on Netflix called Miss Americana about her, which is actually really interesting, like whether or not you're really a fan. Uh, Alexis and I had watched it when it first came out and she actually rewatched it a couple nights ago and I watched part of it with her, but they actually cover the politics thing, like the actual moment in that movie. And it's interesting because you can see, like, it really gives you a behind the scenes view of her camp and like all her handlers. Okay all the people that are making money off her, like not in a, you know, insidious way, but like her dad, I think works for her. And like, she has like a manager or whatever. And I believe this was in 2016. Um, or maybe it was 2018 because it might've been like a midterm, but there was a, I think it was a midterm election in Tennessee, which she lived in Nashville for a significant portion of her life. And one of the candidates was a hardcore Trumper. And long story short, Taylor increasingly felt like she needed to say something and try to encourage people to vote for the Democratic candidate. And the interesting thing in this documentary is you see all the turmoil behind the scenes where she's really pushing for it, but her handlers are like, you're going to alienate half of your fan base. Because, and, like, even to that point, like, they show clips where she's gone on late night shows and stuff, and she is super trying to play it neutral. Like, she would, she was doing the thing where everyone should get out and vote. I mean, I'm not going to say who you should vote for, but it's just important that everyone votes. Yeah. But. Also, I I, kind of want you to do that voice from now on, but go on. Like, sure. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, she finally did, like really fight for it and she made this statement encouraging people to vote for the specific candidate in Tennessee and they didn't win but there was actually a measurable uptick in people registering to vote the day after she released that message like there's like a huge uptick in young people registering to vote so it made a difference and I mean since then she's become an outspoken you know advocate for LGBTQ plus rights and you know really 
has kind of outed herself as a lefty and, you know, has, has fought for, you know, more liberal democratic candidates and causes. Okay. Um, and I feel like in general, over the past five or six years, she has become more confident in just being herself and like kind of saying, again, very shrewd businesswoman. I'm not saying she's really like throwing caution to the wind, but I think she's taken more control of her own self image and like felt more comfortable with saying things that she means. And even in her music, she's become increasingly more self deprecating, which is something maybe we can talk about it in a minute. Um, but yeah, anyway, back to what I was saying. Yeah. Um, so folklore was released in December, 2020. And then shockingly, or this July 2020, I take it back. Shockingly, in December 2020, she releases another album, also made with Aaron Dessner, called Evermore. And it's kind of a continuation of that same direction of kind of like stripped down, you know, more kind of singer songwriting vibe. Evermore is a little more produced than Folklore, but still feels in the same vein. Um, Did not sell as well, P.S. I mean, it's it's as good, though. Okay, I that's fine. Those albums, but anyway, it's inter- interesting that that's like a low blip here on the yeah. discography. So, I don't know that I've ever heard anything off that. I know we probably oh, so have good. Karen has folklore. I'll say, right I'll now. say this. I'll say this. I'm a sad bastard. Sure are. Like I said, the National, probably my favorite band of all time. My so other, listen to them. My other sort of co-favorite artist of all time is Nick Cave. Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds. Also very sad. His last album is basically him processing the death of his son. And it's incredible. Okay. But for the majority of like, basically from like 2019 until now, there have been four albums that I've listened to heavily in rotation just repeatedly. Okay. One is Ghostine by Nick Cave, which is the one that's about the death of his son. Beautiful album. The other one is I Am Easy to Find, which is the last album by The National. And then the other two are the Taylor Swift albums, Folklore and Evermore. Like, okay. If you had told me five years ago that I would be holding her in the same regard as The National and Nick Cave, it, I would have probably punched you in the face. But I feel like you would do um, that anyway, but that's... But yeah, I just... I, those albums are incredible. And turns out she's a great songwriter. Well, Which brings us to tonight. We'll talk about that. <laughs> to bring us to the real topic of tonight. Um, we're going to be doing a deep dive into her most recent album, Midnights, which was just released in October of this very year. Ah. Um, a little bit of a background on the release before we get into talking about it. It was announced during the MTV Video Music Awards on August 28th. She said she had a new album coming out. Um, should mention the Taylor's versions, re-recorded albums, were released over the past couple of years, but Midnight's is her first album of new material since Evermore in 2020. Okay. Um, between her announcing the album and releasing the album, she did a series of social media posts where she revealed the track listing, the names of all the different, well, the names of the 13 tracks on it. But aside from that, nobody knew anything about the album. So we had no idea what the genre or style was going to be. Was it going to be a continuation of the like stripped down folky stuff? Was it going to be a return to the poppy, you know, more beat heavy dancey stuff she had been doing? Yeah. Um, we didn't know who she was working with on it. Uh, prior to Folklore, she had been working mostly with Jack Etinoff as a producer and a songwriter. He has his own music project called Bleachers. Okay. Which I've never listened to. Our uh, mutual friend, Matt Heinzel, apparently is a fan of theirs and has told me okay. I should check it out. But then those two albums, she worked with Aaron Destner, so we weren't sure was she working with either both of them. Um. So Midnight's was released at midnight on October 21st with the music video for Antihero, which is the first single off the album, dropping right at midnight. Um, And subsequently found out 
Aaron Dessner is nowhere to be found, at least in the actual like main 13 tracks. So she's once again working with Jack Antonoff. Okay. As far as the musical sound, to me, it's almost kind of a middle ground between what she was doing and then the Folklore Evermore era. In that it definitely is a poppier direction. There's some dance beats, you know, drum machines, whatever going on. But it also feels kind of low key and like more yeah. like lyric focused. And yes. so it's, it is kind of a weird middle ground between the two, I feel like. Yeah, as somebody who doesn't listen to a lot of her music, this feels very stripped down and very um, focus is definitely on lyrics here and focuses on voice here. And with some minor production choices they made along the way, but it's not knowing her music well, this definitely sounds more like what I would envision some of her, like you said, last albums to sound like yeah. to me, the non-listener, than the like 1989 type era stuff around there. Yeah, I mean, folklore and Evermore are like, more stripped down than this like okay. almost none of the electronic stuff it's all like acoustic guitars and pianos and people playing instruments in a room but um anyway uh do we want to talk about Ticketmaster now or do we want to talk about it after we have the album um we can talk about it now all right well before we get into the album joe needs another drink here folks so he's gonna chug a little out of his fond pilsner Hmm, my fond vodka and Diet Coke. There you go. I should probably go do a shot before I talk about uh, the Ticketmaster fiasco. I mean, you do what you got to do. Ticketmaster is a fantastic company. Oh, they're the best. Love you, Ticketmaster. Give me tickets to the Eras Tour. (laughs) So I don't have dates for this, but everyone knows what happened. Yeah. Taylor Swift announced that She would be embarking on her first tour in several years in 2023, which she has dubbed the Eras Tour. The idea being, I believe, that she'll be kind of exploring the various eras of her career. We talked about how she's kind of changed her direction a few times. Um, So it sounds like it's going to be, you know, an all-encompassing retrospective of her entire career. I, being a fan... And being a fan of live music in general, I really aggressive eye, but go on. I <laughs> being a fan of Taylor Swift. Okay. Um, and also being a huge fan of live music in general, I love going to concerts. Uh I was excited about this announcement. I mean, I thought it would be probably a pain in the ass to get tickets. I've had to fight with Ticketmaster for tickets in the past, so I was ready for that. But a couple things I felt were working in my favor. One, they did this verified fans presale situation where you had until a certain date to enter your information on this specific website to have a chance to be chosen as a verified fan. This is one of the parts that makes this like even worse. They, they, it wasn't even a guarantee if you signed up for this that you would get a presale code. I actually have a friend who's like maybe an even bigger Swifty than I am who didn't get one. Um, so that made it fan. feel like, I know. Um, I did get a code. So I was like, all right, well, that helps me out. Like, especially if it's already a limited pool. The other thing is I had pre-ordered Midnight's on limited edition jade colored vinyl. Ooh. And I have no idea which version my wife has. It's downstairs. Ooh, is it vinyl? Yes. Oh, nice. There were there were four limited edition vinyls, I think, and then a regular one. Which I was is... torn between the jade and the mahogany, but I ended up with the jade because crazy like... to me to have multiple versions. But as a collector, I get it. So well, so if you want to talk about crazy, yeah, here's something you might not have known. Okay, I'm crazy. Um, so the four different editions of the Midnight's vinyl. Okay. On the back of them, if you put them together, it actually forms a clock. Okay. And they actually sell an official thing that's like a clock stand where you put the albums on it. And there's like a clock hand that goes around and and is a functioning clock. And what what would that all run you to get all of that? Probably like, I don't know, over a hundred bucks. I don't know. I've 
I don't remember exactly. I want to say the album was like 30 ish bucks on okay. vinyl. So probably 150 bucks or so. Okay. I mean, again, shrewd businesswoman. Yeah. Um, but I mean, honestly, though, that's a cool concept. I've never seen anything like that before. I mean, 150 is not bad for a clock. And that I mean, that was, that was another thing that was kind of a surprise. Like after they had put these on sale, I mean, they had the, album work posted online front and back but you wouldn't really think like oh they all form a clock and then she released a video that was like hey this is a thing it's a real um, in a box anyway because i had pre-ordered this album i was surprised that like a week before the tickets for the concert went on sale i got an email from taylor nation which is like their official merch whatever okay saying Hey, since you supported us and helped make help this album set all these records, we want to apply a boost to your Ticketmaster account so that when the tour goes on sale, you can be right to the front of the line. I'm like, oh my God, this is amazing. I took a screenshot of it and sent it to my wife because I was so fucking excited about this boost thing. Like, we're definitely going to get Taylor Swift tickets now. Right. Guess what didn't happen? You didn't get Taylor Swift tickets? They didn't get Taylor Swift tickets. Yeah, 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 I was right. Here's what did for you. Here's, here's what did happen. I wasted two entire days of my life trying to get Taylor Swift tickets to no fucking avail. So well, the day the day of the presale, the Taylor Swift verified fan presale, I log on to Ticketmaster. I go to the page a half hour early because they tell you to do that to get in queue. My I, my head's gonna explode here. <laughs> anyway, it was terrible. They Ticketmaster had all kinds of errors on their website, like the queue wasn't working. At one point, they officially froze the queues while they were working on trying to get it fixed for like hours. By the time I finally got to the front of the queue and was in a position where I theoretically could select and purchase tickets, there were literally no tickets available for the show that I was looking at. Oh, the other the other wrinkle that makes this even more bullshit is that part of the verified fan presale was that you had to select a specific show, a specific date in a specific city that you wanted to, the presale for. Okay. So it should have been even more locked out. Like yeah. literally on the day of, you could not try to select tickets for a different show. Like you were locked into the one that you had selected. Okay. So theoretically it should have been fairly likely that people who had all these things would have been able to get tickets. And somehow apparently bots got involved, how they always do. Tickets, Ticketmaster's website couldn't handle the traffic, which is ridiculous to me because this isn't the first time a major concert yeah, for, for sure. from a like crazy popular artist has gone on sale. For sure. So it was just a fiasco. So the next day, maybe it was two days later, there was a pre-sale for Capital One card holders because they're the official sponsor of this tour. Okay. So Alexis, my wife, happens to have a Capital One card. So we both logged into our Ticketmaster accounts and got into queues for separate shows. And same story, hours and hours and hours go by. Everything's fucked up. By the time we get through, there's no tickets available. Um. Friday of that week, there was supposed to be a general on sale uh, for people who didn't have access to either of the pre-sales. And the day before that, they announced that they were canceling the general on sale because there just weren't any more tickets available. Love that. So like a whole lot of us who are, are big fans and had all of the things that were supposed to help us get tickets got severely fucked over. And it's I'm I'm not bitter about it. Why why would you ask? Yeah, you don't sound bitter. <laughs> it's just uh, ridiculous. And I mean, no. this obviously like blew up nation. You know, it's, it was in the news. Yep. And once again, opened the conversation about Ticketmaster being a monopoly and whether yep. that should be allowed to exist. I hate Ticketmaster. Um, I hate Ticketmaster too. But I mean, we've had some conversation about this on Facebook. Like, I don't know what the solution is. I mean, honestly, I think the problem is. I don't think it's necessarily just that Ticketmaster has a monopoly. 
I think it's the fact that Ticketmaster has a monopoly allows them to not give a shit about the customer experience. I mean, that could be because they should be taking steps to make this not happen. They should be taking steps to prevent bots from being able to buy all the tickets. They should, well since past, have enough server capacity to handle like any volume of remotely conceivable traffic that could occur. Yeah. Like that's the biggest thing. This is not the first time this has happened. I mean, I not mean, to go too far down the tangent rabbit hole here, but we kind of had talked about possible solutions, I think, in our group thread that we keep as well. And like to me, it's weird that we still live in an era where for a major concert for somebody like this, they have a pre-sale at all for any artist that has everyone logging in at the exact same time to yeah. buy tickets, period. Yeah, no, I, I agree. mean, I would register your phone well, number and then split them up. You get so many people per 20 minute and apparently, or whatever. I, I don't know the details of this, but from what I've read just in passing online, apparently Taylor Swift did just that on her last tour, on the Reputation tour. She actually, from what I've gathered, had like staggered pre-sales, which okay. makes sense. Like yep. that seems like it would be best for everybody. Yep. So I don't know. The other thing is everybody's pissed at Ticketmaster. I'm pissed at Ticketmaster. I don't think Taylor Swift's hands are entirely clean in this whole thing, which a lot of people are like, and I mean, she's kind of fueled the fire. Like she's really statements like, Oh, I'm so disappointed. Oh, it's terrible. Blah, blah, blah. Like I'm not saying, didn't you even say like she was like silent for like two days or something though? Yeah. Oh, I think it might've even been more than that. Like she didn't release an official statement for a while and it was just infuriating. The other factor in this, aside from just the ability to buy tickets, and this is where she is, like, culpable as hell, is, do you know how Ticketmaster's dynamic pricing works? Yes. So Ticketmaster, for the listener at home, (laughs) yeah, they employ this thing called dynamic pricing, which artists have the ability to opt out of. And this is why I say her hands aren't clean here, because she could have said she didn't want this used on her shows. Um, but basically anytime you're looking at a show on Ticketmaster, you will more than likely see tickets, at least certain tickets listed as quote unquote official platinum. Mm -hmm. And that is the dynamic pricing at work. Basically what that means is if Ticketmaster's algorithm detects that tickets in certain sections are more desirable than others, it will automatically increase the price of those tickets. So you could have tickets whose like base price would be $50, but because of this dynamic pricing, suddenly they're $500 or $1,000 yep. because it detected that they're in high demand. Literally, the only reason for this is to increase their profit. Like, right. it's, it's harming fans. It's making it so a lot of people can't even afford those tickets or can't even afford to go to a show. It's just, it's, it's just terrible. No, I've dealt with that with both concerts and also they run all of my wrestling events I go to as well. So yeah, that's fun. Yeah, it's a good time. So anyway, long story short, Ticketmaster sucks. Yep. I'm sad I can't go to the Eras tour. I love you, Taylor Swift. You have any other options? Uh, I mean, I might investigate that one. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I thought, see, the the other problem is I don't live in one of the cities she's going to. If I lived in Chicago or, like, closer to Detroit, I would definitely look at StubHub at, like, 6 o'clock the day of the concert just to yep. see if there's something affordable. Yep. Like, I've heard that that's a thing that works for people, but, yeah. you know, I don't, I don't live close enough to one of the venues to make that feasible. Uh, I've actually used that for a couple of the events I've gone to recently. Like, yeah. I'll just be, like, Saturday, just kind of generally assume I'm going to go, and then, you know, just... Yeah. Start scoping it out that morning. Somebody will get rid of them for cheaper, or yeah, something will open up. Or so if if one of my fellow Swifties is in a city where she's playing, I encourage you to try that. Um, but yeah, sadly, I just don't think it's in the cards for me. No, I know because um, I teach high school, obviously, and as I mentioned here several times, and it was just chaos in the school those couple days because you had, you know, eighty percent of the female students trying to get tickets and some other random people were trying to get tickets as well. And some of the staff members, I won't mention names in case of reasons, but we're also trying to Mr. check their phones Fanning. to see. Definitely was not me. I'll tell you that. But did, um, did, uh, did Karen or you try to get tickets at all? Karen tried on two accounts and did not get 
tickets on either, but she did end up getting tickets um, through our friend Mike, who randomly was chosen. And what? So uh, that's who got the. Well, this podcast is over. Bye, everybody. <laughs> So she has tickets uh, where I affectionately like to call near the end of the penis on her stage. Um, as Taylor has the giant clock hand, as I understand, it's actually supposed to represent, but mm. it looks just like a big penis coming on the stage. But anyway, so yeah, she has tickets for one night. I know one person I work with got tickets to the Friday and Sunday show right away when they went on sale, like was like, I got both days. And we were like, what the, f- nobody else here got any tickets anywhere. It was like just well, if, heartbreaking stories everywhere. If they crying. decide they can't go for some reason, tell them, you know, someone who might I will. be interested. I'll keep you in mind for sure. Uh, you never know. How, how much did Karen pay for these tickets? That I actually don't know. You probably don't want to know. Um, I think they counted as, I don't remember now, to be honest. Christmas present. I don't really know. I don't know what they were now that I think about it. It's probably it best not to ask. Yeah, I know she she got tickets to uh, a pink concert that's coming to Chicago as well, and I think that's... Nobody her. cares about that. Well, that was easier to get tickets <laughs> for, but that's one of her three favorite artists. Uh, oh, she well, she cool. and I are going to go, and I don't know that I've gone to a concert that she likes more than I likes yet, so that'll be good. That's cool. Yeah. Well, I have tickets to see ben folds in may well that's good it was so hard to get it was not hard to get this wow you got I believe the mansells are also going to that show i think i heard that uh-uh. hope you guys do a live cast while you're there hey everybody we're our friends occasionally not agree we're in the third bum, row bum, 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 just, that's uh... my piano impression there you go anyway do we have an actual episode Midnight. hour into this yeah show? let's <laughs> we're an hour in and we haven't even talked about this album <laughs> everything's great it's all good. All right. So Joe told me I was going to listen to the 311 version of Midnight's, which I was really excited about. Turns I, out. I, I would make a joke, but I literally can't think of a 311 song right now. No. So I listened to it and was very sad. Uh, the band 311 is not uh, anywhere on this entire album, which would have improved it, but that's did, neither here nor there. I did tell Cody that he had to listen to the 3 a.m. version of yes, Midnight's, which features... Not only the aforementioned 13 tracks, but an additional seven bonus tracks, three of which were co-written and produced by my boy Aaron Desner of The National. This is clearly an example of I heard what I wanted to hear when you told me the name of the album. So, uh, Let's go through it track by track. Here we go. Bow, 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 bow. Bum, bum, oh, bum. Oh, oh, oh. It's my impression of the opening track, Lavender Haze. Yeah. What'd you think about that one, Cody? Uh, so how do you want to run these? Do you want me to do my one second and then you can do your 10 minute on each one? And we'll run that one. I just, I'm going to be quick. I only oh, have okay. like, like one just, sentence for I'm each one. I'm just good. I'm not giving you my ratings, right? Cause you want me to save rating till the end yeah. for the album and then my top five. So I, won't, I did, I did rate every song out of 10 as I listened to it. And I did have enough time to get through this more than once. So I was, let happy me ask about you this. That. Do, do any of them have the same numerical rating? What do you mean? I mean, like, it, if you get, if you do give your number ratings along the way, is that going to like obviously give away your top five? Um, some I'm of just it. curious. Oh. I mean, well, I guess one, only one song probably you'd notice That's as a right. standout. But I'm just curious what your ratings are, how you would rate them as songs. Let's I do mean, it. I, give me your give you, throw you, a you want me to it. give you the ratings? Yeah, let's do okay, it. Okay, all right, we'll we'll start shitting right away. That's fine. Here we go. go ahead. All right, so first song, Lavender Haze. I listened to this one the first time. I gave this a. Four out of ten. Oh boy. Oh wow. But upon a re-listen, I bumped it up to a five out of ten. All right. My notes for this simply say chorus, okay. Only the part where she goes high almost falsetto was the good part of the song. Joe, what do you got on this one? (laughs) Well, interesting bit of trivia. This track is inspired by a line from the classic television series Mad Men. Haven't seen it. In which, uh, it's so good. You probably wouldn't like it though because it's good. Um, in which the main character, Don Draper, is describing the feeling of being in love as being in a lavender haze. Ah. I think this is a good album opener for this album. I think it sets the tone for the album. I do it's, agree with that. It's, it's kind of a good jam, Ish. but there's really not much to it. Like, I, I like it, but it's not, I mean, it's, it's not a great song. We just noticed. I, like, I enjoy it, but it's there's not much depth to it. I'll put it that way. 
That's fair. This is Purple Haze, Jimi Hendrix. Next song. Maroon. Five? What's this? Another song? Okay, keep going. I did. Honestly, when I first saw that there was a song called Maroon, I was like, did she date Adam Levine at some point? <laughs> I don't believe she did, for That's the fair. record. But... That's fair. Maroon. Um, what'd you think about Maroon? Okay, I have uh, this song had its rating stay the same through listens. This is a four out of ten. And my notes for this one say, I don't keep behind her swearing. Now, I have not heard her swear in the albums prior to this. I don't think much. So this was kind of new to me from like old school Taylor Swift to her dropping F-bombs and trying to do all these things here now. The problem let's just is, say it's a real fucking legacy. Well, let's just say I don't buy it. Okay, I don't know if it's because she's built an image for so many years, as you said at the onset of all of this, or what, but I don't buy that these are words she genuinely uses. Maybe she does, and maybe, like you said, she's revealing more of her personality, but uh, they just don't sound like they should be there for me. And the sound I put just sounds kind of blah, get to the point, and that's what I put on this one. I love Taylor Swift cursing for the record. I really? feel like I do. I just, I mean, I partly because I feel like it's, you know, not what you would have expected from her. Um, I mean, she does drop some F bombs on, you know, folklore evermore albums. Okay. But I just, I, I feel like it's part of her. Don't say evolution. Em- embracing herself and, and I feel like it's her feeling like she can say whatever she wants to say and not have to have such a closely guarded image. And I like that. I mean, I would believe that if it felt believable when she says them and it just doesn't. Well, I'm sorry that it's you like she's like so. fucking. Can I say fucking fucking? Which kind of my women go to aren't your thing. allowed to swear, according to Cody Fleming. That so, is not okay. true. I enjoy a woman with a potty mouth. My wife does not swear. Oftentimes wish she would swear. Uh, uh. I mean, I often wish she would tell you to fuck off, but... Right? I wish she'd tell me that once in a while, too. Anyway, Maroon. Yes. I've heard that a lot of people really like this song. Uh, Alexis really likes this song. Okay. I think it's okay. It's... it's. I like parts of it. I like the part about... I, I have some lyrics shouted down for some of these songs. Um, well, I mean, I like how this, this song feels like it's kind of the entire span of a relationship in one song from like, oh, how'd this happen to like, well, it's over now. Um, like the line where she says, how do we end up on the floor anyway? You say your roommate's cheap ass screw top rosé. That's how. I like when Taylor Swift talks about drinking because sometimes stuff happens when you have some cheap rosé. That's fair. Um, Yeah. I like it. It's probably if I was rating ranking all of the songs on the album, it would probably be towards the bottom for me. Okay. That's fair. Um, well, in number three, I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on this one. It's the big single off the album thus far, Anti Hero. Yeah. Go for it. Anti Hero. Um, so this one I gave a 7 out of 10, too. Ooh. My comments say, best song yet. A good beat. Catchy lyrics. Definitely seems like one of her, like, poppy radio single type things. Um, So I enjoyed this one. And I want to point out also, because I always clarify my rating scale. I'm saying that these are against any general song you'd put them up against. So 7 out of 10. This means I'd prefer this one over 70% of other music you'd put against it. To be clear, nice. last song, 40%, you know what I mean? So there you go. I appreciate that you're not <laughs> working on some weird Dave Dave Marvel scale where no one knows what it means. No, 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 no. Uh, uh, I mean, I agree with you. Like, I, I think this is probably the poppiest song off the entire album. Agreed. There's a reason it was the first single. Like, it, it, it just has that kind of general appeal. Um... I mean, the it's me, hi, I'm the problem, it's me, became an instant meme. I I mean, I, I, I like it musically. I like that it's poppy. I also like the lyrics because I think she's really kind of 
getting self-deprecating and like exploring her own insecurities here. Yeah, um, I can see that, I guess. It's also a band name again, so there's three in a row. Let's keep going. True. I mean, I know, Cody, I know that you sometimes feel like everybody's a sexy baby and you're a monster on the hill. Um, One of those is true. <laughs> Depends what time. Did you uh, did you watch the music video for this by chance? Or I, did didn't, I did not. Uh, it's fun. Yeah. There's a, a fun kind of... No, it's live action. But there's a fun kind of breakdown in the middle where okay. uh, they have Mike Birbiglia and I forget who the actress's name is, but I think she's from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Okay. Playing her children. Or no, oh. Mike Birbiglia is supposed to be her son and the woman's supposed to be his wife. But there's a part in the song where she says, I have this dream. My daughter-in-law kills me for the money. I she thinks I left part. them in the will. The family gathers around and reads it, and then someone screams out, she's laughing up at us from hell. Yeah, okay. One of my favorite parts. But in the video, they kind of, like, stop, and, like, it's an actual scene where they're, like, acting that out, and there's, like, a little bit more there. I do like the and, Burbigs. Uh, it's fun. I like the Burbigs, too. But anyway, Antihero, great song. Good single. Um, Let me ask your opinion on something that some people might say is weird, but fucking beautiful. It's uh, track number four, Snow on the Beach. I'm curious what you have to say um, about this one as well. So here, let me, before I kick it over to you. Yeah. I have in my notes, Snow on the Beach featuring Lana Del Rey, in parentheses, I put technically. Yeah, she plays the beach. Because because she's listed on the track, but I guess she's doing backing vocals. I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. I listened to half of this album in in class the other day and all of my upperclassmen were giving me notes on all of the parts of the different songs and the backgrounds behind all of them and yada yada. And they were like, she's on the song, but you won't hear her. So no, and I was like, okay, right. cool. uh, I'm curious what you have to say about this one. So the first time I listened to this song, I gave it a two out of 10. Holy and cow. Re-listened to this song. I bumped it up to a three out of 10. Wow. My comments Tell me say, more. My comments for this one say hate this song. No tones. This song sounds like it was entirely recorded inside a metal box. <laughs> and then I have in capital letters hate the swearing. And then I said you hate the swearing. Then so I have much. anecdote here about my wife and swearing, which I've already kind of shared, but my wife doesn't swear, so I think if she started to, it would feel forced and unnatural at this point, and I feel like that's the same perception I have of Taylor Swift, which did make me question whether or not I would actually want my wife to start swearing at this point. That this Taylor song Swift is it your that. wife. Yeah, I know. There's no way in hell that would happen. On my end. Let's just keep going. Oh, boy. She could be so lucky to grab somebody like me. I would love to hear the song she would write about you. Right? It would probably low <laughs> key be delicious. Oh and boy. Fantastic. Oh, I, get, I see what you ah, did there. <laughs> sorry, just low, a little, low just little joke in the hiddle there. <laughs> middle uh, middle. Okay. It'll stun hitting in the middle, son. What um, do you got here? I can't wait to hear it. Your favorite song? Uh I mean, sometimes life is emotionally abusive last two days of my life no i like this song i mean this would probably be like upper third of the album for me um i really i i like the swearing i love the chorus weird like snow on the beach weird but fucking beautiful i've been singing that in all sorts of random contexts ever since this album came out um i like several lyrics too i like in the first verse she says life is emotionally abusive and time can't stop me quite like you did. And my flight was awful. Thanks for asking. I'm unglued. Thanks to you. Like, I like how she just throws the like, my flight was awful. Thanks for asking. Like, it's just this album is kind of a, it's largely a collection of fuck yous to various men. And I enjoy it. Okay. Um, but yeah, I like that song quite a bit. It's not, it's, it's not in my top five spoilers, but it would be probably in my six through 10. Out of the okay. 20 tracks. Okay. Uh, well, you know, I guess for the rest of this podcast, you're on your own, kid. Let's make it short. Here we go. This song, 4 out of 10. I did Any put reason? down old school. Sounds like old school Tay-Tay. Uh, 
kind of a brief song. I don't know what the runtime on this, but it felt very short. Not a lot of tonal change on this one, and I'm not sure what it had anything to do with anything. I like this song quite a bit. Okay. Um, I agree. It does feel a little more like old school Tay Tay. Um, go far, kid. The offspring. Keep going. Five. It's kind of like I, I, I feel like it's about like a young Taylor in a relationship with like a just dirtbag dude. Don't wait to talk and, about John Mayer. Uh, I mean, this is probably I. I take it as like she's probably like a young teenager, like before she was famous. I don't. I could be wrong. Oh, okay. But I get the sense that it's like she's like with this loser guy just because that's what happens in a small town. And she realizes that she needs to like focus on realizing her own potential, like that she knows that she can do better than this. And it's kind of like a self-actualization. Sounds like a role reversal of Avril Lavigne's Skater Boy, a much better song. So number six, I'm very curious to see to hear your thoughts on this one. Purple Rain, all right. Purple Midnight Rain. All right, this one. Um, I gave the song a three out of ten. My notes for this one say... Wow! And I'll read this verbatim. What was that even? Question mark. Brief and nothing. Period. Is this the interlude she plays at concerts while she runs off stage to take a pee? Question mark. Wow. <laughs> what do you got, Joe? Oh boy, I love this song. You would. Uh not so much lyrically, but just musically. It's like a it's like a slow jam. Like I like the the pitch shifted vocals that started and kind of come back throughout and it's got like a nice like a beat like it's almost like baby baking music or something oh it's, i like it yeah maybe um, on the overhead at the clinic when you're donating or something but <laughs> <laughs> what how did you feel about the vocals cuz like throughout this album at various points she uses like like it's all her singing it but she like Use, uses the thing to like change the pitch up and down. Let's uh let's save that for the next song, shall we? Oh boy, all right. Um anyway, I love Midnight Rain. Lyrically it's not my favorite Midnight on the album. Rain. But musically it's up there. It's just a nice jam. Seems like they copied all the lyrics off of Chocolate Rain. Shout out to Tazon. Chocolate Rain. Uh can I ask you a question, Cody? <laughs> it's never stopped you in the past. What? <laughs> What did you think about track number seven? Question, uh, ellipses, question mark. The first time I listened to this song, I gave it the perhaps unfair low rating of three out of ten. But upon re-listening to this, I liked it more. So I bumped this one up to a four out of ten. That's right. All right. So first of all, my notes on this one uh, said, find the metronome meet in the background really annoying. Seem to only be able to focus on the metronome beat in the background. The swearing does not work for me. Oh, God, the metronome noise. Can someone please make it stop? And then the second time I listened to this, I added the little nugget. Did she just add a half second of auto-tune to her voice for one part of this song? What just happened here? All right. Did you not like the line about a dickhead guy because you are one of those? I mean, I don't even know if I got that far because I could just hear click, 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 click through the background. I don't know. Um, I like this song. It feels like it's about like, it's like her having an imaginary conversation with an ex who is dating someone else. And she's kind of like, but have you really moved on from me? Can I ask you a question? Can I ask you a question? Is she as cool as Tay Tay? Easier to get tickets for, that's for sure. But I mean, that's that's one of the things I like about this album is just all the the different aspects of relationships that she's kind of exploring. Um, yeah, I really like this one. Uh, I like the part about the dickhead guy. Uh, I, I like this one. That's good. Um, yeah, I like. I mean, I think we've all been in that position probably where you you find out an ex is dating someone and you're just like, but are they as good as I was or as I was? That's yeah. Um. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, honestly, I it would have been. I dated a girl named Sharon one time. I always thought that about. I've heard that about you. She had a weird last name. 
Yeah, I don't remember what it was. I think it rhymed with Texas. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I can't wait to hear your thoughts on this next tune. Uh, I mean, I spoiler alert, I like I really like most of the songs on the album. Um, I mean, it would have been hard for me to give individual number ratings to all of them because they all would have been pretty high. Yeah. Um, yeah, I like it. Uh, I, I can't wait to hear your thoughts on vigilante shit. There's a, there's a curse word right in the title, Cody. Did that make your head explode? That part, no, because that's not forced. See, that's just the name of the song, which you don't even necessarily get someone singing the name of the song always when you listen to a song. So that part, I'm fine with. Um, two out of ten. My comment on this, I said, this is literally one of the worst songs I've ever heard upon first hearing a song. Not of Taylor, but of anyone ever. The second listening was no better. Did not care for this one at all. Um, Obviously, you can tell my scores are lower on this album, but even amongst the songs on this album that I did not particularly enjoy, this one somehow still stood out as really not a good song. I think it's telling that Cody Fleming has a strongly negative reaction to a song that is about punishing shitty men for being shitty. That's all I'll say. Okay. That's not all I'll say. I like this song a lot. I don't think we're the audience for this song. Uh, For the listener, we are two cishet men talking about Taylor Swift. This is like very, very obviously a song for the ladies, you know. It's about like fucking over shitty men, you know, like there's a line about like telling the FBI about someone's white collar crimes and like it's it's very much like a female empowerment, you know, like be a bad bitch kind of song. And oh. No, I don't, I don't no. think so. I, it, no? it, it, that's just, you don't you think know, that's what it's about? Lyrics can take a song so far. They're important, trust me. But if you just took the music from this and then the voice added to it and subtracted any lyrics, you could put gibberish in there. No, this is, a, this is not a good song. You're entitled to your opinion. Yeah, I know. No, I'm just saying. Like I said, I, I don't think we are the... What I'm getting at here is you can't necessarily... I'm saying I'm fighting your argument because I don't think the lyrics necessarily make the song sound different. It's just the lyrics that are being presented within the song on this one. It could I mean, be about... But, but the lyrics about are part of the song. Rocking things I love, but if it was still presented to me in this manner, I would still be like, this is a terrible song. There, There aren't any songs that you like mainly for the lyrics... No, there's plenty, but I'm saying the way this song sounds is my entire point here, which is not the lyrics. It's how it sounds, I'm saying. They could put anything in here. They could have had a four-minute verse about things that I love, and I would have been like, this song sounds terrible. Okay. But again, my opinion, my opinion. Is it a agree to disagree? Well, friends occasionally yeah. not disagreeing. Cody doesn't like songs about women getting revenge against men who did them wrong, so I'm just... That's true. Maybe we should make a call to texas <laughs> so many jokes i could go with right there oh, right now. But anyway, anyway let's, let's, move let's, on let's pick it up to... a little bit here shall we all right track nine bejeweled what'd you think the jj it is not a song about taylor's it's not about tay tay's with jj the only two times i've ever seen the world the word bejeweled used are for the uh, mobile game or referring to the jj's so we're okay first of all that's called the jazzling it's not called bejeweling no, not bejeweling. That's you're, you're talking like an action. There's the bejeweled JJ, the JJ. All right. Anyway, I gave this a five out of ten, and I thought this was an okay song. Seems like I put uh, just kind of your average background music. I actually reminded me of for some reason something that would be playing overhead if I was shopping at a fancy boutique. Um, and apparently, listening to this a couple of times, there is actually nothing in here about a vagina that I caught. No, because that's not what it's about. It's called right. bejeweled. It's not called vajazzled. <laughs> right, so I give it a five, five out of ten. It's pretty high for you. Yeah, it is one of the ones I like uh, more. Again, this this is another single. Uh, it sounds like it. It's poppier. The music video features Laura Dern, which is always a treat. Oh, did she ever handed dinosaur poop? Uh, sadly, no. Ah, missed opportunity. She does have her hand in Taylor Swift poop, though. That's not true. That's not true. 
And by poop, you mean... No, Cody! Oh. Anyway, I really like this song. It's a lot of fun. Um, Again, it's kind of like a female empowerment. Like, she's been stuck in a shitty relationship, but she's, like, owning herself and taking it back, and, and she still has it going on, damn it. And, and I'm here for it. What about number 10, Labyrinth starring David Bowie? Liked the part with the magic pants dance. Dance, magic dance, magic dance, magic um, dance. I'm magic. not going to like this one if you like this song. I gave it a 3 out of 10. And my comments for That's this... That's kind said, of high for you. God, this, actually, no, but the comments on this one say... The song starts to make you think it's going to do something, and I actually had hopes listening to this one, but nope, it doesn't really do that, and the song actually starts to kind of fade out and go downhill as it keeps going. But it sounded like it was building to something good, yeah. and just didn't get there. Maybe it got lost in the labyrinth. Ooh, you remind me of the babe. Mom. There's another one. I like it, but there's not much to it. Kind of similar to Lavender Haze. Like, they're I, I I like the the refrain of oh oh I'm falling in love again. Like I think the idea behind the song is like you're just out of a breakup and then you meet someone and you're like falling for that person right away and it's like happening too fast. But like there's not much substance to the song to back that up. So is is things happening too fast, which you normally associate with the word labyrinth? No. Interesting observation. Okay. But I mean, lyrically, it feels oh. like that's what the song's about. Gotcha. So just a weird, um, a weird title you're saying. Anyway, this would probably be lower on the rating for me, but I still enjoy it. Gotcha. Um, well, I mean, this is this next one is a concept I would hope you're familiar with by this point in your life, Cody. Yeah. Number 11 is called Karma. Oh, I wrote I wrote that? on Karma. I said I love to dip it apples. Oh. Nom, 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 nom. Karma. I gave this one a 5 out of 10 the first time I listened to it. Second time I listened to it, I dropped it down to four out of ten. What? Okay. I wrote down, again, this is verbatim, her quote, karma is a bounty hunter, after which I just put in a couple asterisks. <sighs> is, but at least the a, tune is catchy. Is that a line in this song? <laughs> yes, yeah, over and over. It's in the chorus. It's like three times in the song. I was like, this is an extended metaphor I am not here for and don't need to come up with these lyrics. Like, this is, I don't know. People praise her lyricism. I'm going to talk about that at the end, but this is just like, build yourself a metaphor.com. Look at this. She says, it, she says it once in the song for the All record. Right. I thought it was more than once. Maybe She says, to karma's on your scent like a bounty hunter. Well. Anyway, I really like this song quite a bit. I think it's I, I it's it's a giant fuck you, but it's like super upbeat and like it it's kind of like bouncy and and doesn't sound like it would be a fuck you. I also like the spin that she puts on the concept of karma because usually you think about it in the context of like karma is going to bite you in the ass, like it's a negative thing. But in the song, she's saying like. Yeah, karma caught up with me and it's great. My life's awesome. You know, the refrain hey is back. karma karma is my boyfriend. Karma is God. Karma is the breeze in my hair on the weekend. Karma is a relaxing thought. Sweet like honey, karma is a cat purring in my lap because it loves me. Like karma's all these positive things because that's what she's earned because she's delightful. Um, but yeah, I just like that the more positive spin on the concept of karma. Okay. Also Anytime Taylor Swift mentions cats, I'm here for it. So. Well, does that include the movie? No. Okay. I've never seen it. Okay. It looked like an atrocity. Because they edited the buttholes out? Is that why? You're waiting for, I, the, I, waiting yeah. for the Snyder Re cut? Listen, release the butthole cut. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> no, but I mean, she is, you know, notoriously a cat lover. And uh, who doesn't love cats? I don't think I knew she was a cat lover. Maybe she gets really? a here. Oh, it's like a whole part of her identity. Okay. If you watch the video for the song, I can't think of it right now. Nice. I'll make sure I check that one out. 
Uh, if you watch the video for Antihero, during the scene where they break it down in the middle, you learn, spoiler alert, that she gave all of her money to a cat rescue. Ah, okay. Or $600 anyway, million dollars or the Ticketmaster sales? Both. Okay. Well, Cody, if you want to lean closer to the screen here, I want to whisper yeah. a, I want to whisper a number 12 sweet nothing in your ear. Yeah. Uh, I liked this one. Yeah? Yeah. So you Give it a... Two, earlier, a three and a half out of ten. Earlier, we had the song that was supposed to feature Lana Del Rey. Yeah, and then here for this song, Taylor actually hands the microphone over to Colby Calais, and actually enjoyed that because it sounded a little better than Taylor Swift actually singing this song. So that was nice. Yeah. Uh, no, this is actually still Taylor. I gave this a five out of ten upon first listening. Listen to it again, and bump that to a four out of ten. Um, did say that it really sounded like Colby Calais type music, which is, I actually would have preferred Colby Calais than listening to this, but that's not here or there. Um, I, I did like the song though. It was okay. Like I said, originally it was right in the middle there, but I didn't feel like there was a lot going on in this song. I you, just, you started by saying you liked the song. Then you yeah. said you gave it a five out of 10. Yeah. Then you said you dropped it to a four out of 10. Yep. Well, when you hear my rating at the end, that'll all make sense. Oh boy. <laughs> but uh yeah, not a lot to say on this one. Just didn't I don't know. I mean, I guess I guess deep, if we me. if we go back to your rating system, if right. you're saying you prefer to listen to this over 40% of other music, I guess it's pretty good. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it as, you know, think about it if you're in the car and you got the radio on. Yeah. You scan through 100 stations, I would like this more than 40 what 40 what you'd find on 40 of those stations. I like this one quite a bit. Um, it feels a lot later than most of the other songs. For sure. I like the like electric piano at the beginning. It's got it's kind of like a nice little bounce to it. Um, this actually feels more kind of, even though Aaron Destner was not involved in this one, it feels more like a step in the direction of the folklore evermore era. It's just kind of like a late breezy song. Um like you said, it's not very substantial. There's not a ton to it, but I, I like it for what it is. It's kind of a nice little treat. If you just realize what I just realized. What? Oh, this is not Colby Clay. Sorry. Yes, Taylor Swift. Go on. Well, this brings us to the last track on the album proper. Yes. Mastermind. What do you think about that, Cody? Um, early example of a PvP board game where someone would create a code and the other person had to try to hack it based on a series of questions of trying to guess the logical sequence, I believe, of marbles or pegs in the original version. I gave it a 5 out of 10. Uh, fine. I said again, sounds like a more traditional old school Taylor Swift song. Uh, I didn't know until before the podcast I had asked you where this version cut versus the... Uh, with well, the 3 a.m. version cut versus the original version of this. So um, it's interesting that this is where it ends. So this would have actually ended originally here with kind of a little more upbeat, poppier one, which is not, I don't feel like traditionally how all albums would end, but with the added songs on here, that's definitely not how this is, not how this is going to end. So let's get to that, I guess. But I gave it a five out of 10 and no revision required. I mean, musically, it's a little more upbeat and poppy, but lyrically, it's kind of a weird place to leave off. Because it's kind of about scheming to try to make someone like you. What appealed to me about it? Like, I mean, I, I, I like that she goes there, but it, it, it's kind of a weird, dark song, like, lyrically. Um, I like there's a, it's like a bridge, I think, where she says, no one wanted to play with me as a little kid, so I've been scheming like a criminal ever since to make them love me and make it seem effortless. This is the first time I felt the need to confess, and I swear I'm only cryptic and Machiavellian because I care. Mm. So I feel like that's kind of a glimpse into her psyche. Like, So you're maybe, kind of saying that she was probably behind the whole Ticketmaster ordeal. Um, I'm, them saying, under the bus. Listen, I'm saying Taylor Swift is behind 9-11. This host views do not necessarily. <laughs> no, I'm just, I mean, the rest I, of the hosts here at Friends Occasionally not disagree. 
I just again, I like how she's getting kind of like messy on this album. Like, you know, this it's kind of a like twisted song, you know. Sometimes people do fucked up stuff to try to get approval or to make people like them. And uh yeah. So that takes oh. us to the three M edition. Oh uh, mixed I mean, up. Co- Don't know Cody, what to do. It's three AM. It must be lonely. Oh, 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 I see what you did there. What do you think of track 14, The Great War? Wow. All right. Cool name for a song. I got to say to start with on this one, obviously, you know, World War One. We were just talking about this the other day. This is uh, pretty sweet as a title and as an intro for a song. Nice uh, extended metaphor for about four minutes long, which is a pretty long extended metaphor for me on this one. I gave it a four out of ten on this yeah. one. I said... um doesn't necessarily do it for me, but at least this one, it seems okay with the personal experience she's sharing. The tone of the music itself doesn't necessarily connect with me too much as a listener. I did like the drums in this one quite a bit. Had like the military style drums in the background. Uh, I couldn't help but be distracted by her use of Crimson Clover here. Just made me think of Joan Jett a lot. Um, but this it, is, it, uh, it, this was good. It made you think of Joan Jett? Yeah. Why? Crimson and Clover. Oh, you mean Tommy James and the Shondells? No, because that's not the version I know. Oh, well, I'm sorry, you're wrong. That's that's fine. That's the '60s version, and I don't really like that one. I like oh. the '80s version. I mean, Joan Jett's awesome. Oh, I'm just giving you shit. Pew, 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 pew. Take a go ahead. Take on me. Uh, I like this one a lot. Um, I, I, I like the, I like the title, The Great War. I like the, the sort of story it tells because it's, it's about going through this period of fight, fighting and conflict in a relationship and things get kind of ugly. But then at the end of it, they survive and stay together and maybe they're stronger for it. Um, and I feel like that happens sometimes, you know, like, Sometimes shit gets ugly and it's not meant to be, but sometimes even if it is a relationship that's supposed to last, things can get ugly for a while, but then you work through it and you're better for it. So I like how she explores that idea. And it, it, I like the metaphor of the Great War to to explore that. Yeah. Um, Bigger than the whole sky. What do you think? Wow. I mean, how much has been written online about this song? Am I right? Holy so much. Shit. So much. So much is right. Um, I get, I like this one overall. Gave it a 5 out of 10. Clearly about loss. And this is where he jumps into the pretty large online uh, messaging board, social media arguments about people trying to determine exactly what this is about, right? Oh, I honestly don't know anything about that. Are oh, you serious? <laughs> 90% of the people online believe this is about a miscarriage. Ooh. So you could extrapolate whether that is actually about Tay-Tay or not, I suppose. Ooh, I guess. I mean, now that I think about the lyrics, I could see that. People who have experienced it. I guess I read a lot of people's accounts just talking about how they were crying about this one because like, it just lyrically hit them so hard as to what they went through. But it doesn't necessarily have to be about that, of course. It could be just about uh, breakup, or it could be about loss of a loved one, or it could be about other things as well. So I did like this one. As I said, I gave it a 5 out of 10. A lot of chatter about this one. My question here was, on this one, why does it sound like every song on this album was recorded underwater? just sounds weird. I don't know if I agree with that. (laughs) I don't know. I don't know. Okay. What'd you think on this one? Man, like I, I'm rethinking it now that right? you put the, the miscarriage thing out there. Because I mean, because it's 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 a parting goodbye, but it's. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I have the the chorus right here. Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. You are bigger than the good sky, and bigger than the whole sky. You're more than just a short time, and I've got a lot to pine about. I've got a lot to live without. I'm never gonna meet. What could have been, would have been, should have been you. Like, that really sounds like it could be about a miscarriage. People interpret that way. But maybe but it also means like... More I than just a short the, time. Like, the full you, you know? And I mean, yeah. And, well, and as you know from your years studying writing, the 
the best things are both specific and universal. So True. Maybe she's writing it about that, but you can take it to mean a new number of things. Could be um, about uh, Caribbean mythology. I like this one. I mean, it's kind of... I think this is maybe the first time we hear an acoustic guitar in all of the album. Hmm, There's like an acoustic guitar strumming in the background. Maybe that helps. Um, so musically, it's like it's pretty chill. Like I like it musically, but overall, uh-huh. it's it's probably on the lower end for me, honestly. Okay. Uh, let's go and to that's Paris. The end. That's the end of the 3 a.m. version. Go to Paris for all intents and purposes. Paris. But we'll, we'll talk about the rest of these anyway. We're going to Paris. I heard there's some people in Paris. Kanye and Jay Z talked about. Let's move on here. Oh um, no, we're canceled now. This is going to be quick. I just said four out of ten on this one. Forgettable to me. It's fine. It's not bad. Just nothing exciting or to get pumped up about. That's fair. I like it. It's not my favorite. I like that she once again gets kind of weird and obsessive. There's a line about I'm so in love that I might stop breathing. Where it's kind of like little too excited and then there's the part where she says i want to brainwash you into loving me forever (laughs) so back to the mastermind here we go yeah i mean exactly like i I like that she's kind of tipping her crazy cards a little bit on this album um yeah i like it it's not my favorite let's move on to number 17 high infidelity all right. Really enjoyed this one with a cameo by John Cusack. It's one of my favorite movies. Talks about relationships as well. Lots of music and records involved in that one, too. So I mean, really- I liked it when Joan Cusack showed up in the middle of it and it was like, Hi, Taylor, you fucking asshole. <laughs> Actually, we are talking about someone else. <laughs> um. Yeah, I gave this a three out of ten what? only on this one. Oh and man, this next this next part's gonna crush you because I know you probably did some kind of conspiracy theory bullshit research into this. But my comment for this I one didn't. says, Taylor, this is me addressing you. If you ever listen to this podcast, I could give a fuck less where you were on April 29th. I want to know where she was. These songs do nothing. Wow. I really like this one. Go for it, man. Tell me about it. This is, uh, I mean, this this is another one that was that features my boy Aaron Dester from the National. Okay, yeah. I like the. Uh, <laughs> I have in my notes. I like the beepity boopity synth in the background. Beepity boopity. Um, there's like a, a Good synth and uh, aha. Keep going. There's there's like a the <laughs> the like drum slash bass of it has this kind of like dark feeling. Yeah which to me is reminiscent of the national. Okay. Um, I like that. And I mean, I kind of like the theme of the, the song. It's kind of like two people who are terrible for each other that are in a relationship and they're like playing a sick game of trying to hurt each other. Who can hurt each other more? Ah. Uh. It's like, and I like, I mean, again, getting messy. Like I like the idea of, you know, like they're they're in a relationship, but they're both suspicious of each other, and they're just kind of like sniping at each other and trying to hurt each other. I'm thankful that I don't like, think I've been in one of those relationships. I've either been the asshole or been ass. Yeah, too. I guess. That I mean, I don't think I have actually been in one either, but I, you know, I think it happens. Sure, I've no, I've I... seen them portrayed in various media. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I really like that one quite a bit. What about uh, number 18, Glitch? Curious what you have on this one. This one has a dubious distinction on the album. Yeah? It is tied for the worst song on the album. Oh, boy. With a 2 out of 10. And my only line I put for this one is, if you know something is a glitch, you probably shouldn't include it. Yeah, this one's really low for me. It's it's okay. I don't have anything to say about it. Plus, it's a weird word to like lyrically sing. I don't know, like the word. Yeah. it's a weird word to use. Well, I'm very curious to hear how much you hate number nineteen. I heard this would have, could have, should have was on some people's chatter online as well. I'm not sure why. Though. Oh, I can, I can tell you. No, I'm glad. All right, so I gave this one a three out of ten. Oof. 
And I said, I really have nothing new that I can add for this song. And then I added the album note. I've heard the other cut of this album was shorter. Maybe they should have kept it that way. Ouch. I don't think these extra songs added anything. I think they detracted. That's me. You said you got some favorites down here. Top five. Tell me about it. Are you having a asthma attack? Uh, I think this is like maybe the like rawest song Taylor Swift has ever written and recorded. Hmm. It is about her relationship with John Mayer when she was 19 and he was 32. Yeah, it's a bad age gap. And how she feels like he robbed her of her innocence and childhood. And she still has regrets about it to this day. And I think it's like she's just like putting it all out there. And I I think it's kind of incredible. Okay. Is that going to make your top five, perhaps? It perhaps. After talking about number 20, Dear Reader, it's a song. I have no feelings on at the end. Dear Reader. Um, Final score on this one for me was a 3 out of 10. However, unlike some of the other songs on this album, I actually have in my notes, this actually was a higher score until the auto-tune kicked in. Dot, 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 Jesus. (laughs) Well, let's get into the top fives, Cody. What do you have at number five? My number five song is Bigger Than the Whole Sky. All right. For Any reasons. extra thoughts on that? No, I just thought, again, it was like, I, I like that it could be interpreted different ways. And uh, actually, it was just kind of a pleasant sounding song, to be honest. Fair. My number five is Midnight Rain to Georgia. Is what? Midnight, oh, Midnight Rain, Rain to Rain Georgia. To Georgia. <laughs> okay. I was like, I don't have any Georgia songs on here. Okay. Any reason why? Uh, I mean, Gladys Knight and the Pips are amazing. Okay, Seri- my number four. <laughs> Ser- serious note. First of all, Midnight Train to Georgia is my favorite song of all time. Actually? Yes, that's a fact. I don't believe you. I Ask my wife. Oh, I will. I, I think it is a perfect song. It is my favorite song of all time. Better than actually, sitting on the dock of the bay. I actually have an autographed picture of Gladys Knight around here somewhere. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, like I said, I think Midnight Rain is just a jam. I mean, lyrically, it's not the best, but it. I, I like the music and the line, he wanted it comfortable. I wanted that pain speaks to the sad boy in me. Okay. Like, sometimes you don't, like, I mean... I'm very happily married now, and I'm super glad to be where I am. But at points in my life, I feel like I've had trouble being just happy in a relationship because part of me always kind of wanted some degree of drama. I think it's like the artist in me. (laughs) So felt that. Uh, Okay. Anyway, number four. Number four. I just want to put a quick note in here, too, that a real fan would have the autograph by the Pips, not Gladys Knight. But let's move Uh on. My number four is uh, the first song. It is Lavender Haze. For the fact that it just sounded like a radio song, I guess. Ish. That's fair. Okay. My number four is Karma. Karma Rollies. And my notes are actually just exactly what I already said. So, okay. Number three. My number three is this will make Joe happy Mastermind. Yay. It's not on my list. But there's that. It's a good one, though. My number three is Antihero. You could pick back and next or Enter Sandman. Okay, go on. There's a reason it was the lead single. It's super catchy. Yeah, for sure. Plus, I love how self-deprecating she gets. Plus, I'm the problem. It's me. Well, they make a good IPA up here. I love Antihero IPA for the record. Right, see? Although right. the, the the brewery is revolution, it's here right. is the actual beer. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. What's number two, Cody? My number two is beje- uh, bejeweled, bejeweled Be- actually, bejazzled, bejeweled for my number two. Um, again, just kind of, I don't want to say brought a smile to my face, but was non-offensive, and that goes a long way. 
You should watch the video. It's fun. Maybe I will. Got your girlfriend, Dita Von Tees, in it. Not my girlfriend, but... I, I'm just throwing <laughs> that out there. Okay, that's fair. It is fun, though. It's kind of like a a weird, like, fairy tale Cinderella kind of thing. Hmm. Um, okay. And it's got Laura Dern in it. My number two is... Rob, you fucking asshole! <laughs> High Infidelity. Again, I just like the music. I like the piano and the sequencer at the beginning. I like the, the lyrical theme. And uh, yeah, I just, it's like... So you lot. haven't researched the April 29th part? I just don't buy that. No. I just don't buy that. I mean, so part of me is curious, but also I don't think it matters because it's just like... It's just... it's the theme of the song with like people being suspicious of each other. It's like, do you really want to know where I was on that date? Like, fuck you. All right. My number one number song. One, Cody Fleming! Well, my number one song is probably the one I've heard the most, which is anti-hero. And it's the only one that got a, uh, above five score on my list here. So it's Big number one. seven, right? Yeah. I got a seven. My on God. That one, so anti-hero is my number one. My number one is, Dun, dun, fuck John Mayer. Would have, could have, should have. I was like, that narrows it down to four songs. Which ones are you going to pick? All right. Uh, I have, God what damn it, is she of. putting it... My, my notes are, God damn it, is she putting it all out there on this one? Hmm. This feels like one of her most raw songs ever. I also like the change in instrumentation from the rest of the album, which I don't think I said we were talking about it before, but... This is, I think, the most kind of like people actually playing instruments song on the album. Okay. Like it almost sounds like just rock instruments uh, and feels more in line with like the folklore Evermore era. I'm going to just as a one more further piece of currency here. I'm going to re-listen to this song since it's your number one pick. Just throw right. that and throw that in my piggy jar of stuff, including this podcast that I have on my Joe owes me for Lincoln Park podcast. Oh boy! List. So there's that. All right, what's next, Joe? Um, do you want to do you want to give the album overall a numerical rating? Boy, do I! <laughs> boy, do I not want you to! Oh, you might. What What do you got, Cody? But you might not. All right, so. Three thoughts on my final number here, which I have saved till the end of the podcast. Oh, boy. All right. Um, things you may not know about me. Number one, I do not like Taylor's reputation. Number two, I do not think she has a good singing voice. Can number three, I'm not impressed by her lyrics, but I get how they could work for other people who are the super fans or constant relationship can, can i can i interrupt for a second absolutely was the reputation thing an intentional pun or were you, it wasn't on that one okay no, unfortunately i can't claim that um <laughs> and then other thoughts i have here it says all of these songs sound like they're just waiting to escape from a box but she never lets them free and actually do something which i think there is potential here but the musical choices to go along with some of the lyrics that you love didn't work for me um, I feel like they could have been highlighted and expanded on and emphasized, and they just weren't. It was very monotone album to me, but maybe that's just me as the non-Taylor Swift fan. I don't know, because I know you would accuse me of like enjoying bands who has a lot of music that sound the same. I get that. Yeah. No, I mean, I I will actually grant you that a lot of the songs on this album do sound fairly similar, but I mean, I... I think I'm more interested in her as a lyric writer. And that's why it works better for me. Like, that makes sense. I mean, she's done the pop thing. She's done the, you know, crescendoing, whatever, like catchy, you know, songs that build and go places and explode. And I, I think, I think this is. Well, so this her... is. What? Go on, finish your thought, and then I'll respond to that. Well, no, I think, I mean, I think this is her, like, I think she's trying to focus more on the lyrics, that she's trying to, like, explore some, oh, geez, <laughs> getting so worked up here, I'm hitting my microphone with my hands. Um, I think she's, like, exploring themes through her lyrics here, and I think, I feel like that's more important to her at this point than, you know, necessarily trying to write the catchiest songs. 
I guess my question, and I don't know her well enough, and I I would bet truthfully no super fan would know this other than her herself, but I guess I just don't know as a listener if she is doing this because she feels like this is where she needs to be and how she needs to express herself at her life at this point, or if she is hooked on this idea of constantly trying to reinvent herself with new styles of music, or she has like this magic checklist of genres that she's just attempting to go through because... What I hear you saying and what I hear when I hear her singles that come out and different snippets through all these albums for the last how many years is somebody who is constantly reinventing themselves, but not always to greater what they actually sound like and how I would perceive them as an audience. For example, if you take somebody who is considered a legend of whatever industry it is, country, jazz, rock, whatever, they usually don't change their sound all that much through a 20, 30 year career for some of the legends. And I would argue that they always hit their wheelhouse with everything they put out for the most part, because they don't trend too far away from what's safe for them. She is constantly trying to reinvent herself. And I think that's a detriment to her here to me as not a fan of hers, because she's already established some areas where I do enjoy her more than this particular style of sound. So to me, this is a down album of hers though I like other stuff of hers more, I don't need to see her try this new style. But I don't know, like I said, if she's doing that because that's where she feels she needs to be, or if that's because she's just like, look at me, I'm so diverse, I can do everything. That's true. ACDC could put out like a rap album if they wanted to, but it doesn't mean it's going to be good. <laughs> I mean, I I think she's exploring. I think that's what these past few albums have been. And I mean, I think like her work with Aaron Dessner, I could speak to, she apparently is a big fan of the national and was at one of their concerts and like talked to him backstage and it was like, Hey, we should work together, but didn't really think anything would happen of it. And then during the pandemic, they were both isolated in separate places and she emailed him and is like, Hey, you know, whatever. Yeah. But I think, I think she is constantly trying to figure out like what sort of artist she wants to be or like, what she wants to say at a given moment. And I mean, to your point about artists staying in their wheelhouse, I think that's how artists die. Like some of like going back to my favorite artists, Nick Cave and the national, both of their last albums, I think are each of their best albums. And they are so different to where they started out. Like, Nick Cave's last album sounds absolutely nothing like anything that he was doing, like, 5, 10, 20 years ago. It's, like, a completely different sound, but it's just amazing. And The National on their last album, probably at least half of the vocals are done by female singers that they brought in. So it's, like, not even the lead singer of the band doing a substantial portion of the vocals on the album and I think having that contrast, like it's just it just works so wonderfully there. I mean, it's so... different and it can extend your career. And I guess I was just thinking as you were saying that back to another album uh, artist, rather, we reviewed like U2, which has kind of tinkered with their sound a little bit, not as much as Taylor Swift, but a little bit through their albums. Again, I would argue they've gone downhill from their peak. But it has kept them relevant, which I guess if that's what you're saying for Taylor Swift, I don't think she needs to do that at this point in her career. But it does keep her relevant and it gets people talking about her new style. Well, I'm saying I think I think she's evolving. I think sometimes artists evolve. I don't necessarily know that. I mean, releasing two albums that are like super stripped down and super sad with a guy from an indie rock band that most people have never heard of is probably not a move she made in order to increase her popularity or audience or like, because she felt like it was anything that like she needed to do from like a popularity perspective. I think it's just something she felt like she needed to do as an artist. You said something interesting there whether she felt like she needed to do it. And the question to me, I guess, as again, a very, very casual listener of hers would be, again, is this something that she felt she needed to do herself as an artist, or is this something that she perceived that she needed to do as an artist to her fans? And that's kind of the, the point I'm getting at here, where maybe she is trying to evolve. 
maybe she thinks that there's like now this expectation with her fan base that what is she going to put out next? Like you said, what kind of albums are going to be? Who's I mean, I can tell you a lot producer? of her fans hated those albums because they were so different from what she had done before. The two prior to this. Yeah. Like a, a lot of her fans from before that think that collaborating with Eric Dester is the worst thing, worst thing she ever did. Okay. I mean, I, that's what I'm saying. I don't think she's doing it because she thinks her fans want it. I think she's doing it because it's interesting to her. Like it's a direction she wants to go in. Like if you listen to those albums, like it's, it's not what you would expect from Taylor Swift. It's not, I mean, again, those albums are why I became a huge fan. Like I liked a lot of her poppy stuff before that. Yeah. But, and I mean, maybe, maybe this is getting back to your point and why you didn't like this album. People have different tastes. I am a sad bastard. I tend to like more downbeat songs that are, that are more focused on the lyrics and like introspection and exploring internal feelings and, you know, things like that. And, you know, that's, that's what I want from the national. And that's, that's why I have really liked these last few Taylor Swift albums because they've been more in that direction. I mean, I can totally understand why someone who's not as sad a bastard as I am, you know, would not be into it and would maybe yeah. want something a little poppier. But oh man, that's just making me want to do the Lincoln Park one even more now. But that's neither here nor there. Oh boy. Um, all I, right. I'll say this: I'm not, I'm not opposed to it. Oh, you you already like, agreed to it on the air. We have it. I just, recording. I just feel like I need time. Like I'm not going to listen to their discography in the span of a week. I would need it's like only seven albums. We talked about it, but that's fine. We'll I would need we'll like a month. Like we'll I don't time. know. We'll Plan for January. Be ready. Here we come. Mm-hmm. All right. Last comment to have on this before I finally get to this number here is this is Taylor Swift's Saint Anger album. How dare you? Now listen here. How dare you? Here's why I say that. And I admit I have not listened. Like I, said, I do not hear any back and forth. I do not hear Lars Ulrich pounding on coffee cans in the background. Oh, it's on one of the songs. That might have been the metal tube she was in. I'm not sure. Uh, uh, but here's my point I'm getting at with this one. When I listened to Metallica as it was coming out, I got as far as St. Anger. That was the last thing I had heard. Yeah. Uh-huh. And I actually liked Saint Anger. Not as much as the old not as much as the old stuff. Not as much as the old stuff, but I did enjoy it. When we went back and looked as a whole at their discography, I was like, this is their worst album. Actually, I probably preferred it to a little bit of the thrash stuff at the beginning, but that's neither here nor there. My point is re-listening to it amongst the artist's entire career, I realized that it was not as good as I thought it was. And I say that for this album because I'm curious if in like 10 years, people would go back and listen to Taylor Swift's discography and be like, ooh, that was a really low spot, that album that came out. Because I feel like I gave low numbers on these songs, of course, but I don't feel like I actually dislike Taylor Swift as much as my scores today show. But I'm curious if like the hardcore fans would later on go back and look at all of these and be like, yeah, that's that doesn't hold up as good. It's not as great. I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe not. I mean, Rolling Stone gave this album five stars and called it an instant classic. Well, they haven't been good since <laughs> 1983, so that's okay. Have you, uh, b- before you give your score, have, yes. you, have you heard the new Metallica single yet? I haven't yet. No, ah, it's good. I like it a lot. Anyway, no, I haven't yet. It's got one of those fun little letters, right? With the it's yeah, it's from, that they stole it's like a Latin name or it's something eternal like or, e or yeah, or it's the e. All right, what's your now, score? Here's my score. After all that, all said and done, I know I... Give me fuel, give me fire, give me a numerical score for this album. Right, that's what I'm talking about. A lot of low scores individually on songs on this one. However, I do sometimes look at an album cohesively, see if there's an overall message or story or through line here. And I do feel like this one benefits from all that. So despite most of my scores being lower, my total score tonight for the Midnight... 3 a.m., not 3.11, album is 7 out of 10. Wow! No, I'm sorry. That's the number for X is divided by 2. Uh, Hold on. I got to go for here. Oh, no. Oh, boy. 14 X is. I'm sorry. Hold on. 2 out of 10, isn't it? Uh, No, it's not. All I did today to keep it fair is I just took all the songs with their scores, added them, and divided them by the 20 songs. 20 songs, right? Yeah. So my final score today... And one of my lowest scores ever on Friends Occasionally Not to Disagreeing is a total score of 3.7. Wow. 
10 out of 10. Good night. No, I'm kidding. Um, See, I even still liked this better than Justin liked Rings of Fire. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Almost twice as much, actually. You know, is, is that the lowest score ever? Is okay. that official? Other than one of those supernatural episodes. Well, I, I mean, actually happens. reading something, not just like odds of whatever existing. Anyway, I I really like this album. I don't necessarily think it's perfect as Rolling Stone and some others do. Um, Five star, really? Five stars out of ten, you mean? No, five out of five, baby. If I'm being honest with myself, I'd probably give it. You know, I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually lower my score a little bit from what I initially had written down. I originally had it at an eight, but instead, I'm gonna give it a seven and a half out of ten. I think uh, I really like it. I, I think it's pretty strong. I don't think it's as good as Folklore or Evermore. Those would probably both be 10 out of 10 for me. Like, they're just all-timers. This one is not quite up that high, but I still enjoy it quite a bit. Tick. Tock. Tick. Tock. Frantic. Anyway, so we're... Past the two hour mark on this Taylor Swift podcast. Holy crap. Uh, we should probably wrap it up. Yeah, let's wrap it up. Uh, well, as always, I'm Joe. That's Cody. Hey. And we are. Friends. Friends. I'm in a submarine, but I'm recording not this Taylor Swift album. Disagree. Occasionally not disagreeing. It's fun. Hi. Where the problem? It's fun. Auto tune. <laughs>